Thank you very much. Hopefully everyone can hear us well. Um, just first of all, I'd like to welcome myself, the esteemed panel we have here this afternoon, truly assembled uh, from across the world. And I think we can look forward to some extremely interesting perspectives from Europe, the United States, and Japan. But so what are we here to talk about? Well, established markets, as we know, are often seen as leaders. And as we all know in the world of fintech, it's just not quite so simple. Fintech adoption rates clearly and well known to be lower in established markets than in emerging markets. Anyone who was here earlier for the ASEAN session would have heard talk about just how much easier it is to get someone who is unbanked to switch to a better looking solution than someone who is quite happily banked. And the leapfrog effect is well documented. Perhaps all this is well compounded by the idea that established markets have structures, they have processes, they have regulations, they have habits, all of which are, are hugely well established and obviously much harder to change. So in an environment where, where growth is slower than emerging markets, will the fintech boom bring that second growth cycle? That's what we're here to talk about today. Will it provide the fuel to power mature financial markets moving forward? And we're going to address all of these questions with the panel. We're going to explore what's being done, what needs to happen, uh, and how uh, established markets can really harness the positive energy of the fintech boom. So it's not an easy question to start with here, but is fintech giving mature markets a second wind? And I think, Bob, from your position with Deloitte, with a, a very sort of global market overview. Interesting to hear from you first what you think. Sure, thanks Mark, and I'm very pleased to be here on the Deloitte stage, so uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I, I think that the real question here is strategic priority um, and whether or not the Western markets will and how quickly will they adopt the FinTech potential and then will it drive growth or not. Uh, there, I think it's clearly happening more slowly. Uh, we did a survey recently of financial services senior executives, and only 45% of C-suite executives in North America felt that the financial services industry would be fundamentally transformed in the next five years. Compare that with 70% of executives from Asia. So I think there is still a significant gap in the US, as another example, we're still talking about mobile banking maybe in five years hitting a 30% adoption rate, whereas yesterday you may have seen that Alipay, Alibaba, had 70% mobile transactions on $25 billion of shopping in the shopping day that Alibaba created. Um, so there's some very significant changes, very significant differences. Um, so I think the, the real question is how quickly will the mature markets adopt the technologies, and once they do, they have significant challenges like agility. How do they really take large organizations and make them agile? Collaboration. Uh, most large financial institutions are not admittedly very good at being either agile or collaborative. Um, there are significant talent issues uh, and will be significant talent shortages. So I think there are some very significant challenges and some very significant opportunities, but clearly there's a big gap between what's happening in markets like Singapore or China. When I go back to North America, I tell my clients they should come here, they should come to Hong Kong, they should come to Shanghai, they should come to Israel and see the future because so much more is happening in these markets than is happening in North America. Okay, and from, I mean, we have a perspective here, Oki, you, you have a, a global financial institution uh, under you. What do you see in this, in this regard? Well, I think uh, technology is a really universal language. It's for, not, it's for young people, old people, Asian, Western, everybody. Like uh, law is not for kids. The law is something only adults or some adults, only some adults can understand. But uh, technology is something that uh, the kids or anyone, depending on who it is, but anyone can understand and, and embrace. So this is really giving a new field for many people while it is limiting the some, um, uh, ability to some people. Like, uh, you know, um, as Bob said, there is a, some a gap between the uh, Asian CEOs and uh, Western CEOs. 
I think it's a good example. Uh, depending upon if the CEO, the management, embrace or understand the technology, then the, that company or that institution or that nation can take advantage of those uh, technologies. But it may not happen if they don't embrace that. So I think uh, this uh, you know, technology, fintech or those technologies, really creating a very exciting playing field for everybody. And it may be or may not be the good news for much other markets. It all depends upon what the management or leadership understands, appreciate, and embrace those technologies. And you mentioned there the corporate leadership. We have two examples uh, sitting here of government leadership as well. And from the perspective of the, the Bank of France, what, what are the, the, the governments doing to, to make this uh, a positive for mature markets? And, and what are you worried about? Well, first of all, I would like to remind everyone that uh, mature, mature markets have a long-standing tradition of innovation. Uh, the names I'm going to call may look like dinosaurs to you, but they were truly breakthrough, like ATMs. Everyone forgot about them, but they, they were a breakthrough. Uh, cheap credit card as well. And then we had the impressive development of um, international markets and more recently mobile banking. So we are not faced with innovation for the first time. The difference is I think that we have a breakthrough in technology and so a lot of disruption. And the question is what to do about that. First and foremost, I think it's up to the corporates to react, and that's what they're doing. I can assure you that in mature markets, banks, insurers, they're eager uh, to answer their customers, they're eager to boost their profitability, they're eager to have a future, and they're very keen on importing either tech for fin or partnering with fintechs. And we have many, many examples in France of a lot of partnership uh, between mature financial corporates and fintechs. So I think the answer uh, is, is pretty clear. The mature system is all for um, using the new technologies. Now, they're customer driven, that's for sure. And we should not overlook that a number of customers are not equipped right away to handle these new technologies. So there would be still a lot of human channels working. Interestingly enough, since mobile banking, for instance, we did not see a decrease in mails or phone calls or appointments with financial advisors. Quite the contrary, it picked up. So you have a multi-channel um, diffusion at work. And I think it's all for the good of the financial system. Now, maybe we could come back to the official authorities later on. Uh, what I can tell you is that Banque de France is fully involved in fostering development of new technologies, using them itself, and allowing a principle-based regulation which would precisely allow for development of new technologies. Thanks, Anne. Um, we'll come back to some of those points a little bit later on. Um, but Jörg, a, a question for you, really. Switzerland, probably the most traditional of all uh, of, all of the financial services uh, markets. How is Switzerland facing this? How worried is Switzerland about being left behind? Well, me, we might be a very traditional country, but at the same time, we are extremely in innovative. So, uh, and it's because we do not have another choice than being innovative. We are a landlocked country, we don't have many natural resources. All what we have is our human resources. And in order to remain on the edge, we need to be innovative. So from that point of view, it is clear that we have to embrace this trend. Our institutions do that, and they are on the forefront of the fintech in Switzerland, but also abroad. Uh, and from that point of view, <clears throat> I think the only option that we have is to embrace this new trend. And from a regulatory point of view or from a government point of view, we need to provide the framework in which uh, this new trend can, can, can start to grow and can, can develop. So 
in order to be innovative, you have to have a secure framework, you have to have a stable environment, you have to have a legal framework that is settled, you must have some framework conditions that attract these innovative spirits. And from that point of view, we, I, th I believe we are on the, on the right track. And, and the business is ready to embrace it. We have a very traditional business, as you said, uh, but, but that can be a very interesting symbiosis of, of young, very uh, agile uh, fintech branch and some traditional business models that can converge and, and work together. And we strongly believe that this is a recipe for success. But I mean, none of us can deny that the, the pace of change is, is slower uh, in the mature markets. What, what's behind that? What is there that we need to overcome to, to speed up that pace of change? Well, you have to remove barriers to market entry. That's, it's true. We, in, in, in regulated markets like Switzerland and, and the mature markets in general, the regulatory framework is quite strict. And that's why we try to, in our approach with regard to fintech, we try to remove barriers to market entry by having, for example, created a sandbox where there is no regulatory framework whatsoever. There are some basic principles that you have to follow, but basically there, there, are, no, there are no rules and regulations to apply up to public funds to one million Swiss francs. So you are free to develop and to, to try out your market model and see if it works. And once it works and once it becomes bigger and starts to grow, then, of course, the regulatory framework sets in slowly but steadily according to your, to your growth rate. So the first goal from our point of view in order to provide a framework in which fintech can function and work is to remove market barriers to market entry in order to make it flourish. And the, the sandbox idea clearly, I mean, clearly well, uh, well thought of, well celebrated where they exist. Bob, you're about to jump in, I'm sure, to tell us where they don't. <laughs> no, I was actually going to comment on the point about why uh, you, uh, why uh, mature markets are lagging behind. And I, I don't know that they're lagging behind as much as they're not accelerating as quickly. I think a lot of it has to do with m emerging markets using technology to pull people into the financial system. And they are essentially an, a native population that are using technologies for the first time. And so there's a consumer adoption aspect to this that I think is very significant. So the, the emerging markets or the high growth markets are, are moving forward very quickly at a very accelerated rate. I think largely off of that phenomenon, the mature markets have to now figure out how to catch up and continue to move quickly. But I think they're moving at a pace that you would expect mature markets to move at, but they don't have the same dynamic that you have in an environment where you have native users that are being pulled into the financial markets for the first time in a whole different technology environment. I, I, I tend to agree with Bob. The matured markets are so accustomed to regulate the uh, supply side, you know, the service, uh, service suppliers side, like banks or brokers. But the fintech is really shifting the main player from service provider to the uh, users. So the regulator needs to think about how it can help users to enjoy the new services. But the mature market regulator tend to think about how they can regulate the, the banks or those service provider side. I think that is something, uh, you know, the shift of viewpoint uh, may be needed. I'd, I'd like to um, defend the case of regulators and supervisors, if you don't mind. Um, the truth is, historically, we have had a regulation which has been entity-based rather than activity-based. But I think we are going to move to an activity-based uh, concept. So I'm not pessimistic about the fact that there would be a change in the way regulation is conceived. Now, if you get to basics, what is regulation about? It's about risk control. It's about consumer protection. It's about uh, anti-money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, so, and it's about it, data protection for individual persons. So we have a whole array of, you know, missions for the uh, supervisors and the regulators. And I think all of them are thinking on how to fulfill their mission while onboarding new technologies, okay? So it's not going to be overnight. But it's happening. Let, give you, let me give you an example. You're a supervisor. 
why would not we use the new technologies? And they're using it, okay? Most of their trade is collecting data and analyzing data. Uh, I don't need to elaborate on what new technologies are offering them to do that. So now we have this classification between supervisor technologies, regulator, uh, regulation technology for, for the financial players, etc., etc. So I think really the move is, is going on in the official sphere and that there is no hindrance to innovations. I mean, the usual question is, is whether regulation you know, try to pursue after innovation or whether innovation triggers regulation. I think the iteration has been constant over time and uh, it's going to happen again. And there's no reason to be pessimistic about the fact that we can have regulation friendly to innovation, neutral vis-a-vis -vis innovation, because we don't know what's going to be the best technology tomorrow, agile, and in the meantime, uh, preserving market integrity. Because, I mean, it would be no good for the fintech community if you had a gigantic fraud based on new technologies. This would be a setback for everyone. And I think supervisors and regulators have a <coughs> positive contribution to bring. But that is, I think, you touch on the, the big dilemma here, the regulation versus freedom. <coughs> we talk about the sandbox model. We know how effective that can be in... in multiple jurisdictions, there are those who've chosen not to do it. Um, so let's name and shame for a minute. I mean, which of the mature markets are doing a good job in getting the balance right and, and, and which are not? And I'm going to look to you, Bob, as the, the, the sort of neutral speaker who can say these things. I, I, I don't know that any are doing better than others per se. I mean, I, I think that the mission point is a really good one, which is that the mission of an established market is very different around risk management than the mission of a market where you're trying to create financial inclusion and you're trying to attract capital. And so I think the missions are very different, and that is resulting in adoption rates that are very different, regulatory positions that are very different. Um, you know, so if you look at the mature markets, there are certainly some uh, countries, some jurisdictions where they've been probably more aggressive around trying to either pull in uh, fintechs or create an environment where fintechs can prosper or, or have a more regu a regulatory friendly environment. Um, I'm not sure the U.S. has been necessarily the most progressive in that regard. They've probably been behind for a lot of reasons. Um, and I, I think the Canadians, uh, the Australians, um, even some of the European markets are clearly ahead of the U.S. in that regard. So I think the U.S. has a lot of work to do to get to the right balance that you talked about of managing risk of the financial system, but also promoting innovation that is ultimately going to take the marketplace forward. Because ultimately, many of these products and maybe the future of financial services is borderless, right? It's, you know, th all these, all these uh, financial products that are online are all transcending borders, and so we have to get to some level of consistent oversight, regulation, financial engineering, um, and so it's critical that everybody catch up. But I think for now, some of, the, some of the markets, especially the U.S., are definitely behind. I mean, a couple of points there. We, we should just have a look at what we think is a good model. There's the sandbox model. There are other ways of trying to achieve the balance. I mean, should we be seeing more sandboxes, more countries adopting a model like we see here in Singapore? Like uh, well, m maybe we should, we should talk about what we should not do. And from our point of view, I grew up in a liberal economy and, and I believe that the government shouldn't intervene as less as possible or as little as possible. And what we definitely did, decided not to do was to pick and choose certain, uh, for example, startups or fintech models that we would like to promote and make them grow. We strongly believe that the government just needs to, to, to set the framework. Consumer protection is an issue. Integrity of the market is an, is an issue, of course. But apart from that, you should try to have a model that allows the whole fintech um, uh, trend to, to grow up and, and to be, be, become stronger and, and an interesting business model for the industry. So we should not uh, try to focus on, on, on certain industries because we do not know in what direction fintech will, will go. We just need to set the framework in which it can move and develop itself because we are unable, the government at least, or at least we think we are unable 
to decide in which direction it should develop. So we just need to set some barriers, some, so as, as you just mentioned, we should set the barriers in which they, they, it, can, it can develop itself freely and unhindered and unfettered from, from any government intervention. But Oki, from where, where you sit on the, the corporate side, is it moving fast enough? What do you see? Well, the, today, this internet age, uh, whatever you regulate, people will, act, people will trade around you, uh, you know, away from you, right? So if you regulate your country, you, you say that you have to protect you know, the individual people. You're right. But then the, you know, the, your, your people may trade somewhere else, right? And then, you know, so those country will uh, grow that business. And then you're going to lose the business as well as the controllability on that, uh, that thing. So I think uh, it is probably a better way to go to embrace thing fast and then, you know, try to think about regulation. But, but I have to tell you, you know, I, I'm an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs usually hate regulation. Okay? And, uh, you know, we think that, uh, you know, please leave us alone, right? So, but you, you have to so carefully embrace them. I mean, mature the market has got a huge market, right? So if you do the game cleverly, then you can get big business. And then not only you regulate, but also you, you, and then you, you can protect your people too. Right, so the, I, I think this is something that uh, uh, the regulators in the uh, mature the markets are really challenged to come up with a very clever way to grasp transactions and, you know, correctly grow them. I would just say, it, it, it's sometimes quite easy to sit there and say to governments, you should be doing more to help us. I was going to throw it to, to our two government representatives, or at least, um, at least representatives of state, to, to say what you would like to see companies doing, what you would like to see fintech companies themselves and startups doing to make the whole collaboration easier. Um. First of all, uh, just uh, a detail, but central banks are independent from governments. <laughs> just to remind everyone about that. Um, well, it, it's, the answer is pretty simple. We like entrepreneurs to come and discuss with us and explain to us what are their viewpoints, what are the hurdles from their viewpoint, and try to find out what the best way to make progress. And just to give you an example, in our supervisory authority, we have created a tech hub, and we've been able to have a dialogue and help 200 fintechs enter the area of financial activities. So it's not about not wanting fintech, it's about discussing with them, understanding the business, uh, and finding with them where in which they would develop and we would achieve our mission. Now, um, there is an elephant in the room. And, uh, it's presumably a mammoth. Um, it's about risk. Nobody has said the word cyber risk. Okay? And I think this is a big, big issue. And it's, it's true for the entrepreneur, and it's true for the authorities as well. And I think this is key um, on the uh, principle-based regulation, is how to make sure that everyone, fintech themselves, incumbents, authorities, have the proper cybersec tools and can check whether we reach a satisfactory level. So that's a very important point. On competition and you know, barriers to entry, the, the answer is difficult because when you look at it from a broad viewpoint, since the crisis, we have had a concentration in the financial sector, right? But the degree of competition has increased, not decreased, between the system. Maybe for the reason you were mentioning, that we are living in an open space, a cyberspace. But cyberspace is not synonymous with absence of regulation. 
I mean, there are legal frameworks which have been adapted to cyberspace, which have been adapted to cross-border transaction, and it doesn't mean that from now on, Japanese citizens or European citizens are deprived from any protection. So I think we, here again, we have to find a balance. I think let's, let's stick on that international theme for a moment. When we look at, at mature markets and the challenges that are faced, um, which, which may be reasonably consistent, is there enough cooperation between mature markets in, in addressing these issues? I think that's a, a, an important point to, to stress. We're talking a lot about cooperation and partnership as the future. How about between the markets themselves? Well, we have set up a body which is called the uh, Financial Stability Forum. Um, in which all countries participate, more or less. Very few of them are not members. And it has done a, a lot of work on fintechs recently. They've released a report on fintech. They've released a report on AI. I mean, there's a lot of work going on, which means that there is a dialogue between all authorities. The thing in Europe where we are lucky, if I may, is that by contrast to the US, we have single authorities, right? So we are not fragmented in several authorities. I mean, in the US, it's kind of complex. You have the Fed, you have the FDIC, you have the controller of the currency. Too many. You have 52 insurers, controllers, you have the CFTC, etc., etc. So it's, it's kind of a complex landscape. In Europe, it's much simpler. You have, at most, three national authorities, banks, insurers, markets, very often, they're under the same umbrella. Very often, they're close to the central bank. And on top of that, you have three European authorities coordinating. So as far as coordination is concerned, I think we have a bit in advance. I, I think, to, to, uh, sorry, to come back to your question, indeed, there's probably there should be more collaboration on, on, that, on that front internationally. But for the time being, we also have to keep in mind that this is a still a very young and fastly growing uh, sector of our industry. Uh, what we try to do is, first of all, we, we try to attract international fintech, uh, uh, the international fintech community to Switzerland. We have, a, we have something that we call uh, um, uh, Crypto Valley uh, between Zug and, Swit and, and, and Zurich, where we try to attract those fintech companies, foreign companies as well, in order to, to speed up uh, uh, the innovation in Switzerland as such. And we also try to reach out from a government uh, side, we try to reach out to other mature uh, uh, countries like Singapore, for example, but also Israel, where we have established so-called fintech bridges with which we would like to foster the collaboration between our supervisory and regulatory authorities. Uh, for us, it's very easy because we are extremely small. There is one regulator, there is one supervisor, and we can, we can provide each and every fintech industry or company a, a tailor-made service in order to be either to establish themselves in Switzerland or to reach out in order to scale up their, their business model abroad. So, so there, should be, there should be more cooperation, especially on the regulatory, on the regulatory uh, side, in order not to have jurisdictions that start to regulate on a unilateral level, but rather to strive for an international national standards, which is probably a little bit far-fetched and not really, from my experience, not feasible, but at least that should be the ideal or the direction in which we sh should be heading. I think the uh, international cooperation is, of course, very important and very needed. It should happen. But uh, meanwhile, it looks like to me the similar to like, uh, like uh, foreign exchange uh, policy or operation for the each country sometime like uh, you know they don't do that these days but sometimes country try to you know cheapen the the currency to to get the demand from the world no 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 no, no. Don't, don't talk about japan okay <laughs> and so but uh, you know this thing and also tax as well like uh, some someone like singapore can reduce a tax to attract activities. So it's kind of uh, while the cooperation is very important, needed, but meanwhile there are kind of competition over those uh, regulation and, uh, and policies. So again, you know, it, it is something, it, it, you have to really cleverly design the whole those framework. And it's, to me, it's, it looks very interesting. 
and uh, you know the Singapore, Estonia, Canada, and everybody you know trying to compete the kind of business model or framework to attract those businesses, and that's other mature other markets cannot just ignore. I think just just for a moment, just to remind the the audience that you can submit your questions through pigeonhole. Um, we've got a, a couple here that I'm going to move on to in a moment, but Anne, did you have something you wanted to add to, to Oki's point there? I just wanted to pick up the point about taxation. Uh, because, I mean, we're living in a world where we've been faced recently with a series of events which are pushing hard in the direction of tax cooperation, trying to plug tax evasion, trying to avoid distortions which allow big corporates not to pay a cent of tax despite their P&L, right? So I'm not sure competition uh, is on the tax territory. I think quite the contrary. The tax territory is getting narrower uh, for competition. And as far as the uh, cases you mentioned, um, Estonia, of course, is famous. Uh, it's a very topical example. Canada is working as well, but you should not overlook Europe. I mean, Europe is doing a lot um, to foster, in particular, in an area you're familiar with, payments, mm. right? We are setting up right now an instant payment system in the euro area, and we have been the pioneer for a single euro payment area system. So these systems are, for me, uh, good examples of a corporation or if you'd like a public-private partnership in a sense, these systems have been set up with a dialogue with the industry. And, and you, maybe you're not aware, but there are a lot of experiments in Europe about blockchain technology. It's not only in Australia and the stock exchange, uh, it's in Europe as well. And to give you uh, an example, in France, we are just passing a law allowing distributed ledger for non-listed securities. So, I mean, it's moving. Maybe we are not as good in marketing as other countries, but we are doing it. <laughs> I think just as if, I, if I can step in, what, what, with, to come back to the taxation issue, taxing the digitalization is now very on vogue. And, and uh, that's uh, just to come back to what I said at the very beginning, we really should take care or try to avoid uh, to having jurisdictions who start to tax the digitalization, the digitalized economy by themselves. This is really something that, that would destroy the whole dynamics behind it. We are very much in favor on a global solution, maybe to have certain principles set out uh, with which you are able to, to tax the digitalization. But, but to revert to, to individual, to, to sim single jurisdiction starting to, to tax on a, on a, on a purely jurisdictional point, from a jury, purely jurisdictional point of view, would probably be beyond beyond any any good because because it's we are in a, living in a, in a globalized world and we need international standards that are strictly adhered to and not having jurisdictions start to start to tax uh, on, in an uncoordinated way. Okay, I'll move on to that that audience question here. There's a theme that's popped up in um, in a couple of these. I, I particularly like the wording on this question. E-wallets are making inroads in, in developing markets. So when it comes to established markets, are they a, a solution in search of a problem? In other words, are there just a, a lot of fintech innovations that just don't apply in established markets because there is no problem that's there to be solved? <laughs> well, there are many, as we talked before, the, the fintech is really the customer's experience. And we tend to think that uh, in the developed markets, the, uh, we are providing the enough service to customers from supply side, uh, from a service supplier side. But uh, you know, the, uh, the customer's experience is really changing. You know, if you go to the China, you know, it, it's just beautiful uh, as regards to payments and all kinds of experiences. Just it's, it's a night and day compared to like a 10 years ago, five years ago, right? So uh, the, the uh, matured markets tend to think that, uh, well, it's already good. It's not. Customer's experience is really changing. 
So uh, I think there are still uh, lots of lots of uh, spaces for the uh, fintech can do, of course, for the you know uh, developed markets. So you're saying, I mean, it, it's more about thinking what's possible and how we can improve things, not not just looking for problems. It's not only improvements, you know, uh, fintech or those new technologies can provide a new experience, not just the improved experience, but new experiences, which, you know, the, uh, we shouldn't, we should never underestimate. Yeah, I, I think it goes back a little bit to what I said before, where you have established customer relationships in mature markets that you didn't have to the same extent in emerging markets. So I think what's starting to happen now is as fintechs are partnering or collaborating more with incumbents, you're going to see more of a shift towards the usage of some of these fintech capabilities like eWallet or there are lots of other examples as well. But they'll be, they'll be offered to clients and clients will start to accept them as a collaboration with existing service providers. So I think that's why the, the collaboration model between incumbents and fintechs is really critical in established markets and much more so than it was in emerging markets where fintechs were going into white space. So that, that's why I, you know, I think the collaboration model is really the critical part because the incumbents still own the customers in a lot of cases and that relationship is hard to break. But if the collaboration happens, then you can just create a tipping point with the customers and the fintechs will then get access to the customers through the incumbents and that will create the adoption. And that does bring us on to a very important point, which is what, what fintech looks like in a mature market, and does it look any different to an emerging market? The partnership is, is a key point. Is that the way that we're really going to see the biggest innovations in mature markets through working with the incumbents, would you say? Well, I, I won't make any prediction, but what's pretty obvious right now is that the incumbents have a keen interest in partnering with fintech. So it doesn't mean that fintech cannot do the job alone or you know, develop themselves outside the incumbents. But what's, what's for sure is that the incumbents are trying very hard to partner and to be able to offer their customers new services, payment services, but also other services. And you know, they're, they're keen not only on technology, on partnership, they're keen on human resources, for instance. I mean, we're discussing incumbent like, you know, they were all populated with all guys. It's not the case. I mean, they have a lot of millennials too. And they have intern labs. They have their own experiments. So you have a lot of things ongoing. But in the end, what matters is what the consumer wants. I mean, you may think a technology is very interesting, very... Uh, innovative, uh, likely to bring down costs, etc., and all for the good of everyone. But the truth is that you have customers' preferences. And to, to uh, just come back to the example of e-wallet, the preferences for using banknotes, which may look, you know, in our discussion like a prehistoric thing, is very varied among countries. I mean, Japan is very high, Switzerland is very high, Germany is very high, the US are very high in using banknotes. You have other countries, like the Nordic countries, where cash is disappearing fast. So you have not only to take into account the supply dimension, but also the demand dimension, and I think it matters too. So with that kind of thinking in mind, I mean, let, let's look to the future um, a, a, a little bit more as well. I had a, a question on here uh, which raised one theme, if I can just call it up, wanting to know what the panel's views are on how ICOs might work in established markets um, where the existing capital markets are well developed, and for that matter, cryptocurrencies, all of these potentials, do they have a place in mature markets? Are we going to see central banks issuing cryptocurrencies? Let, let, let's, let's look a little bit ahead. Yes, being a central banker, I have to pick up the question first. Um, well, a few remarks. On ICOs, we have a very varied landscape. I mean, going from they're forbidden to um, they're allowed, but submitted to a regulation which is not 
on um, the classical basis, if I may say so, is more on a commodity or securities universe kind of regulation. So they are not, you know, the, the tokens, to call them like that for ICO, they are not deemed like currencies in a, any place, I think. Where ICOs are allowed, even there, the token is not deemed as a currency. So it's, it's a proxy for a classic share. Now, the question is mainly whether investors understand that, whether they have any info on the counterparty risk. And this is highly debated. So we'll see what happens to ICOs. So far, so good. If I may say, in, in a number of countries, there hasn't been scandals. But they may come around because the legal status is very unclear. Not on the ICO itself, and the concept is clear, but what are the rights attached to the tokens? Nobody knows, right? Now, on cryptocurrencies, the answer is pretty simple. They are not currency, they are commodities. I mean, Bitcoin is not a currency. We should get rid of that name, if I may, which has nothing to do with the fact that there may be a future for digital currencies. So that's a different issue. And then you come to whether there would be central bank digital currency. It raises a whole host of questions, and they're very important questions. And perhaps the best answer is to tell you, look at the Bank of Sweden, the Riksbank, the Central Bank of Sweden. The Riksbank is in a country where cash has almost disappeared. So the question of a digital currency being issued by the Riggs Bank has been raised. The Riggs Bank has given itself two years to offer the, the answer. And you have many different systems possible for a digital currency. So I won't give an official position today. Let's think about it, but be assured it's a key topic that all central banks are considering but they're very careful. Currency is trust. And we shall never forget that. So that's the reason I'm a bit tough on the actual crypto commodities. <laughs> well, you're right. Cryptocurrency is a digital commodity. But uh, it's growing too fast, very fast. Now, the market cap of cryptocurrency is like uh, 200 billion dollars. Uh, it was uh, just like a one-tenth a year ago. So in a year, it will become maybe more than, it might become more than one trillion US dollars. And the people will start using them as a settlement tool. Okay, for the cross-border transactions, people use those cryptocurrencies, bitcoins, and then the authorities will lose taxing capability. So you can't ignore th this, this, this thing. You have, to, you have to introduce the central bank cryptocurrency or digital currency or national digital cash or whatever you call. Unless you move very quick, you know, you're going to lose a huge base for taxing or KYC or many things. So uh, I think even two years, is, uh, it seems to me too long. Well, let's, uh, we're, we're rapidly approaching the end of our time here. Um, but I think we should keep on that thought. The next two years, five years, short, medium term, what are the big changes that, that each of you think that we are going to see? Uh, what is going to be that key area in mature markets where fintech starts to make a really tangible difference? I believe that will happen in the back office. Compliance and, and how, how banks and, and insurances are organized. There are no tools available in order to become more efficient. That's the first point. And the second point, I believe that fintech for mature market is an, is an instrument and tool in order to penetrate emerging markets, where you can use the fact that, that emerging markets are able to leapfrog. In Africa, everybody has a mobile phone, but banking or, or you know, this, the, the network of banks is almost non-existent. So from that point of view, fintech will provide opportunities for, for mature markets to reach out and to use it, it as a tool in order to expand their, their economic activity. Within, within the, 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 
the, the mature markets, it's a question of efficiency, as a question of, of how to organize your business better in order to focus on, on the client-to-client -client relationship and in order to keep the costs down. Okay. Okay, um, the winner should be data handling, data exploitation, you know, big data. I think everything about data is going to be key for irrespective of the technologies, they're all based on data. So that's number one. Number two, I think, is uh, distributed ledger or blockchain, whatever name you prefer. I think there are so many experiments um, that it's, it's likely that you know, it would be one of the big uh, area of development. We ourselves in Bank de France have um, experimented with banks, um, distributed ledger, and we're very happy. It, it's up and running. So it's for an identifier. I spare you the details, but basically it's something which will grow. And the last one is about, I think, instant payments. Uh, but I still have my reservations about Bitcoins, Ethereum, and the like. Because, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, Bitcoin has just lost 29% of value last, last day. So, I mean, it, it's pretty much like a commodity. It's very, it's very far away from a currency. So th the question you're raising is more about, you know, what should be um, the attitude of the authorities vis-a-vis -vis Bitcoin? I mean, in France and in Europe, we, we have a very simple stance. It's not a currency, full stop. Uh, before I make my comment, just one quick uh, counter is that, uh, you know, the the crypto world, they can create a data peg cryptocurrency. It's a digital commodity, but it doesn't have to have that kind of volatility. It can pegged. It can peg to the data or whatever currency. And then, you know, then it can, if, if your definition of the commodity versus currency is a volatility, then we can fix it. But anyway, uh, I think, uh, <coughs> I think the, what's happening in the fintech or deep learning or AI or cryptocurrency, I don't think that is only one kind of service application. They are in the market and they will influence every place in the capital markets. It's like uh, you know, derivatives in 1980s. You know, the, we initially thought it's, some, it's something that uh, some uh, you know, rocket scientists are talking about and it doesn't it's nothing to do with uh, the, you know, the core capital markets. But today, you know, the, car, you know, the f futures and swaps and everything really all over in the capital markets. It's a very important part of the market. The fintech, deep learning, crypto, everything are, will be, are and will be in the capital markets. It will impact the formation of the capital markets. It will impact, it will influence the currency movement, FX movement, even interest rates, stocks and everything. So the f this thing is going to be really not a standalone thing, but a very important part of the capital markets, I think. And it brings us back to where we began yeah, there, Bob. So. What, what, what's your view on what the medium and short term holds? So I was going to go two places. First was data, which I agree with Anne completely, and we haven't talked enough about uh, there was a panel before us that talked about data. I, I think the data, both on the regulatory and compliance side, around making more efficient and more effective the way that we are able to evaluate risk and evaluate compliance, I think is going to be a big, a big, um, a big improvement. And I think on the customer side, the ability to customize products, uh, customize risk. Uh, be very specific around uh, around clients and what they're looking for and a real customization. So I think data will be a very large one. Uh, the second one that we haven't talked about is, I would say, is the rise of platforms. So we're talking a lot about fintech here, but if you think about what's happening in the marketplace, what's happening more is more is there's a convergence of transaction volume, whether it's buying behavior or whether it's consumer attention in the consumer space around platforms. Again, whether it's WeChat or Alibaba or Google or Facebook, 
know, they are controlling the customer interface, and I think that that is going to be a major issue over the next two or three years, is how are financial, in how are financial institutions dealing with that phenomenon, how are regulators dealing with those platforms as more and more they are controlling the consumer attention that starts to go very heavily into financial services. So I'll leave it at that, data and platforms. Okay, Bob, Oki, Anne, Jörg, thank you very much. Um, I think we are out of time. Very interesting comments from you all, very different perspectives. I'm not sure whether we've answered the question as to, to whether mature markets are going to get a second wind, but one thing's clear, there's a lot of change ahead um, and a lot's going to unfold that maybe none of us can fully see at the moment. So thank you very much uh, and thank you to all for listening. Thank you.